they dance, they flail, they're a big, wacky, and awkward way to get your attention. But did you know these tall boys debuted at the 1996 Olympics as art? Meet Peter Minshall, a prominent Caribbean artist, known in Trinidad as the creator of larger-than-life dancing puppets created for Carnival. His work made its way to a book called Caribbean Festival Arts, and that book made its way to a man, a man on the steering committee of the Olympics. Peter was commissioned to help create an unforgettable opening for the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. In a moment nothing short of pure genius, Peter returned to his roots by sketching a puppet-like structure. But this time, he turned it into an inflatable airman that would move and dance, just like his manned puppets. For this, he had to call in another artist, Daron Gazit, an engineer who happened to be obsessed with anything inflatable. Between both men, they were able to accomplish the seemingly impossible. 60-foot, inflatable, two-legged, dancing men. The tall boys were nothing short of a success. After they graced the Olympics, Gazit got a patent and licensed the design to various advertisers. Now, they're everywhere. Use car lots, crop fields, shopping centers, you name it. So the next time you see a big, ridiculous, inflated tall boy waving at you in the distance, just imagine you're in the Caribbean, dancing along to the drum beat. You know this riff. It's the song American Woman, originally created by this guy. Uh, my name is Randy Bachman. I am was in the band The Guess Who. It was a big hit in the 60s and became one of the most iconic anti-war songs of the Vietnam era. When you look back in time and go, wow, that absolutely changed our life. That didn't change our life. It changed everybody's life. It changed the world. It changed radio. But here's the thing, that song that changed radio, it wasn't born in some recording studio, but by accident, live on stage in a Canadian curling arena. So it's a cold February day in North Dakota. Randy and the rest of the Guess Who just crossed the Canadian border with the intention of playing a show down in Texas. While filling up their truck at a local gas station, a US Border Patrol officer was calling out to them. He kept saying, hey, boy, you got to go into that building over there. Boy, you got to go into something. And it was some sort of service building. I'm not sure what he was saying. Because of their green cards, the officer was telling them to enter the selective service building to be drafted and sent to Vietnam. So we were, like, terribly frightened. We uh, got into our car, drove a couple hundred miles back to Canada, and um, we're in Canada without a gig. So Randy made a call to a booking agency, and because of a last-minute cancellation, he was able to find a gig at a curling arena in Waterloo. And uh, we, we were playing a three-hour dance, and in the middle of one song, I broke a string. And our lead singer, Burton Cummings, said, well, Randy's broken a string, we don't have a spare guitar, he's going to change the string, so we're going to take a break. So everybody was kind of sitting around talking, so I had to get that guitar in tune. So as I was on stage playing that E chord, I play an E chord, a B chord, a D chord, and another E chord with the strings ringing, and suddenly I get dun dun da 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 And I'm going, oh my God, I don't want to forget this riff. So I stand up and I start playing, and I turn my guitar, and I'm playing it louder, and I look into the audience, and uh, came running up was Burton Cummings. Finally, I yelled out, sing something, sing anything. First thing he sang was, When you're a songwriter, you hope for inspiration from somewhere. You don't know where it's going to come from. You don't know how minuscule or how gigantic that little moment is going to be. Take that little inspiration and uh, put some dry fuel on it, some dry paper, and see if you can build a bonfire. You never really know where it's going to come from. You never know how far it is going to go, where it's going to take you. This is Charlie Hall. Hi, I'm Charlie Hall. This is Charlie Hall's kitchen. I make a fabulous cup of coffee. This is where Charlie Hall sleeps. This is it, the water bed. And that bed is the whole reason we're here. It's sensuous. It's like taking your bed to bed with you. Charlie Hall invented water beds. I, I currently own three water beds. Charlie created a counterculture alternative back in the 70s. Remember the 70s and fern bars? It was like for the groovy people. Right. 
You're too young for fern bars. <laughs> in the 80s, they were as mainstream as they can get. You could walk into any store in America and buy a waterbed. How groovy is that? At their peak, more than one in five of the beds sold in the United States were filled with water. But it all started with a novel idea Charlie had when he was in grad school in the late 60s. He had an assignment to analyze and improve human comfort. So I talked to physical therapists and doctors, and a whirlpool bath came up as a frequently mentioned item about soothing temperature and water. Charlie's first prototype was a chair filled with jello. But there was a problem. That was uh, 300 pounds and not terribly practical around your living room unless you had a forklift. So Charlie switched gears and focused on beds. The bed evolved into a water-filled chamber. I discovered very quickly you needed to compensate for the temperature. So he added temperature control. And when he showed the assignment to the class? Everybody loved it, and they couldn't get enough of it. And guess what? Charlie got an A. The original waterbed patent. I applied for a patent shortly after I developed the product, and I got a sense it was going to be a success. Charlie is still a self-proclaimed waterman. This is Charlie's view. This is his boat. And this is Charlie with his latest invention. Inflatable kayaks that store in the trunk of your car and paddle like a real nice boat. Okay, that's great. Back to waterbeds. The second coming is upon us. The new version will blow the old waterbed out of the water. Pun intended? Yes, pun intended. Little trees. They're a rear view mirror staple, protecting noses from offensive odors all over the world. But where do they come from? Over 60 years ago, a scientist by the name of Julius Simon had a chance encounter with a milkman that changed the course of the air freshener game forever. It was in Watertown, New York. A milkman was making the rounds when he stopped to speak to Julius, a German-Jewish chemist who fled the Nazis and studied alpine tree aromas in the forests of Canada. Said milkman began venting to Julius about the stench that spoiled milk left in his car, and thus the quest began to destroy bad car odors. Julius drew inspiration from the tree aromas he studied by infusing their oils onto paper. In 1954, he filed a patent for tree-shaped paper infused with odor-destroying air perfume. Julius then started producing the air fresheners out of an empty auto shop and sending samples to local gas stations. The little trees were a big hit, and Julius successfully created the first automotive air freshener. Though the look remains the same, the scents are forever changing. Now the Little Tree Company has over 60 cents and has sold over a billion little trees worldwide. Without Abraham Lincoln and really his beard, Milton Bradley, the godfather of board games, would have never existed. Bold statement, I know, but let me explain. The game of life. The spinner, the cars, the choices. College or career, kids or no kids, lawyer or farmer. This family game night staple was once a pretty morbid game. Back in the 1800s, Milton Bradley was in the lithograph business. Following the Republican National Convention of 1860, Bradley printed thousands of images of Abraham Lincoln, who was clean shaven at the time. Shortly thereafter, Lincoln debuted his iconic beard, rendering all of Bradley's prints worthless. His lithograph business went belly up. So Bradley was forced to try something new. He came up with a board game, a seemingly dark and twisted board game appropriately named The Checkered Game of Life. The game functioned in a similar way to how it does now. There was a spinner, colored circles that moved around the board, and of course squares that could either make you or break you. The squares on the original game were overwhelmingly grim, boasting actions like disgrace, poverty, ruin, crime, prison, and, well, suicide. Regardless, the game flew off the shelves. Kids loved it, and Milton Bradley went on to own Family Game Night. Fast forward to about 100 years later. 
They revamp the game, trading Bradley's morbid squares for the more delightful ones like Payday or Graduation, which we have all come to know and love. And so there you have it, the story of the game called life. Thanks, Lincoln.